So this is Alyssa when she was a baby, when she was first learning how to walk. Every day I have to get up and pretend I'm happy. This is all of our family. Tina Russell is a woman haunted. Do you know what it's like every day to walk around with a broken heart? Broken under the weight of a question that's cursed her family for 14 years. What happened to her niece, 21 year old Alyssa McLemore? I believe she was taken against her will. I don't know if she was killed. In April 2009, Alyssa was a single mom, raising a toddler and living with her family in Kent. Once her mom got sick and she had a baby, it, it made her grow up. As she grew up, the 21-year-old became a dancer, active in the nightlife scene. She had been picked up by police in the past. But Tina says Alyssa was always there when you needed her. So when Alyssa got a call on the night of April 9th, 2009, that her mother was dying, she told her family she was on her way home. But she would always come home, and she didn't come. To the family's surprise, the next knock at the door wasn't Alyssa, but a Kent police officer. Police had received a frantic 911 call from Alyssa's phone. On the 911 tape, Alyssa is asking for help. Police never let Tina listen to the call, but they did provide her with a transcript. There's somebody in the background telling her to come here. I don't know if they said, I'll hurt you or I'll kill you or something. And then the phone went dead. Kent Police Detective Brendan Wales took over the case in 2017. It's not very often that you have the voice of who you potentially believe is the killer um, unidentified on a recording. Alyssa's family says it began to dawn on them the real danger she was in. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, more than four in five Native women experience violence in their lifetime. It just hurts to know. And this is what I say, Native people fall through the gaps. It doesn't matter what she was doing in her life. This intersection off Pacific Highway South in Kent is where Alyssa was last seen. Witnesses say she was getting into a green pickup truck with Oregon license plates. Alyssa's BlackBerry phone didn't have GPS, so investigators could never pinpoint exactly where the 911 call originated from or who the male voice on the line belonged to. A few years later, I did ask to hear the tape, and I was denied that. Now it's a piece of evidence. So maybe I know this guy's voice. Maybe I could recognize him. 14 years have passed. The family wants to know why not release this 911 call to the public. As investigators, we don't want to taint the investigation by releasing that, we will be inundated with assumptions and conclusions and, for lack of a better term, a red herring of who it could be. The detective told me he doesn't have manpower to take detectives from over here and put them on this old case over here. At that point, I sat and I draw, I drew on a board, this is where we're gonna search first, and that's what we did. So if the family makes a sweeping statement like, police haven't been to any of our searches, you say that's not quite the case. Yeah, that's not, it's just, we're not in a position to say we checked here, we checked here, we checked here, because it's, you know, notifying every place we don't find her, um, that's disappointing for everybody. It's just a hard situation to be in. Soon, hundreds of families like Tina's may be getting a powerful ally. Attorney General Bob Ferguson is championing a legislative effort to create a multi-million dollar indigenous cold case unit. Especially when it comes to missing and murdered indigenous women and people, we really felt and the task force believe that a specific unit dedicated to this work could help address and solve some of these cases. And that brings us back to Lake Fenwick Park in Kent. Four years ago, the family received a tip that Alyssa's remains were in the park. I will not sleep at night if I got one tip that I did not follow up on. I can't say it's how deep it is. While searching, they came across this deep abandoned well on the edge of park property. At the bottom, what looks to be a tarp. I don't know what's under there in my mind. will always wonder until somebody does investigate it and say, nope, she wasn't there. Ken police never searched the well or took measures to cover it up as a safety hazard. We can't even get the city she's missing from <laughs> to come and even take serious. They've never sent a team out here. Based on the cell phone records, it's, it's miles away from where even her cell phone would have been, and it just comes down to a time and resource of where it's at. We pushed Detective Wales and the city to investigate, and at the very least, cover the well. Like, that's a safety issue, a kid, a dog, anything can go down there. 
The day after we spoke to Detective Wells, he and his partner came out to investigate. He confirms the well will be searched and investigated before it is filled. This is one of my favorite pictures right here. I don't think I've ever shared that picture with anybody. Meantime, life trudges on in Alyssa's absence. Her daughter is 16 years old and now helps in the search for her mom. She helped me make flyers. She decides what pictures goes on flyers. Tina hopes the burden of this horrible mystery doesn't haunt Alyssa's daughter into adulthood. I don't want another family member in my family to die without answers. I don't want to die myself without answers and the next generation have to pick up this search. For Facing Race, I'm PJ Randawa. The Attorney General's office has already identified more than 100 cold cases involving Indigenous victims across the state of Washington. The legislation that would create a statewide Indigenous cold case unit is now waiting for a vote on the House floor.